colleagues on the Monday morning, 95% <laughs> of the time, not an earthly. Honestly, because I mean, I behave like a complete homicidal maniac, and I'm a relatively responsible <laughs> member of society. <laughs> Sutton with the header, John Hartson this time, 1 0 Celtic! John Hartson! The relationship between the fans is poisonous, and it can be on occasion quite violent. You know, the bile, the outpouring of bile, especially during an old firm weekend, is still quite astonishing, even to someone who's been born and, and bred in Scotland. Traditionally, the rivalry between Glasgow's two main football clubs has been based on a religious fault line. In the blue corner, Rangers are seen as a Protestant club, and in the green, Celtic, a Catholic one. Not that I saw much evidence on the terraces of theological disputes about transubstantiation. Religion in Glasgow has always been as much about belonging as believing. Which side you belong to, and which side you don't. I've just always hated Celtic. I've just hated Rangers. You always hated Celtic. Aye. Why do you hate Celtic? I just hate them so much. Really? Aye. Is that just a figure of speech, or do you really? No, I do. I hate them. Oh gosh. Is it about religion? Maybe a wee bit. Aye, aye. What don't you like about Catholics? I just hate them. When you're brought with that, it's just. You don't really question it at all, you just sort of go along with it, that's, that's the way it is, we're we are Celtic, we support Celtic and if it's Rangers, well, we hate them because all these guys round about us are all scheming at them and that must be right to do that, you know. I mean, it's just sort of tribalism, really. The Catholic community would always gravitate towards supporting Celtic and that meant that on the other side of the city, you know, Rangers supporters were mainly Protestant and I think that's where it started. I don't think the clubs themselves uh, initially you know, would turn around and say that they started solely for Catholic and solely for Protestant. Rangers may not have set out to make the club exclusively Protestant, but a tradition quickly grew up that they never signed Catholics. By the 1980s, it had become obvious that this policy was affecting the team's performances on the field. There were good tactical reasons then for ringing the changes. But in poaching Maurice Johnston, a Catholic Celtic hero, the manager Graham Souness not only sent a signal to Rangers fans, but managed to cock a snook at the old enemy. <laughs> what about what about when players play for the club of the other denomination, when Mo Johnson? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> He's talking about evil. <laughs> evil. I mean, there was what? There was grown families that weren't speaking to each other because there was mixed marriages or whatever. It was a horrible time to be in Glasgow. But Mo Johnston knew exactly what he was doing. He had to move with my burly minders around him all the time. Um, he couldn't go to certain places, couldn't go out alone. There was a real threat that he would have been attacked. His first year at Rangers. Maurice Johnson was probably one of the top three forwards in Europe at that time. I thought he was magnificent. I would have to say he had to be, because the pressure was really on him. Johnston, and he scored! The sectarian rivalry doesn't stop at flags and singing. It can and does turn violent. It can be deadly. Mark Scott was a schoolboy Celtic fan who was on his way home after a match from Celtic Park up there down this main route into the centre of town. He was wearing a Celtic shirt, which he didn't bother to hide as he went through this Protestant enclave here. There was thousands of other Celtic fans streaming through that day, and he passed a pub, a Rangers pub, and uh, a young man, a 22-year-old ma young man, stepped out from the pub doorway and came from behind Mark and slit his throat. To think that that young boy was leaving his house on a Saturday morning saying goodbye to his mother and father and would never return is absolutely mind-blowing. It took something maybe a little bit as tragic as that to realise that the players probably have a responsibility to stand up and let people know that this section or this fraction of the support that both sides have is totally wrong. Mark Scott's killer, Jason Campbell, came from a family with a known record of sectarian crimes. Mark's father said there had been two victims in the incident, one obviously his son, but the other, was, the other victim was Jason Campbell. He said he was a victim of the community, the family and the environment that he grew up within, which I thought showed incredible presence of mind. 
Jason Campbell was defended by one of Scotland's leading barristers, Donald Finlay, who also just happened to be Rangers vice chairman. Nothing wrong there. Everybody's entitled to a legal defence, and Donald Finlay has also defended Catholics accused of murder and other violent crimes. But it left some people feeling uneasy, a feeling which was made worse three years later. These are the amateur video pictures which captured Finlay singing sectarian songs at a private party held in a ranger's social club. What I found difficult to understand was having represented someone who was found guilty of particularly horrendous sectarian attack, how he could then still indulge in graphic sectarian songs. The particular song that he was caught singing, the lyrics of it were up to our knees in Fenian blood, surrender or you'll die. The point was that the words of these songs was actually being acted out in the streets and young men were dying because of this. Donald's a Ranger supporter, but I never known him to be totally bigoted. You know, he supports Rangers and these were the songs that go along with Rangers. So he was caught up and he paid the price for that indiscretion. In his letter of resignation, Finlay says the events of Saturday night were a serious misjudgment on his part and that his conduct was not acceptable. I do feel sorry for Donald Finlay when all he was doing was exactly what thousands of other people were doing. I can understand that completely. But it's also let the cat out of the bag that sectarianism wasn't just a working class problem. It wasn't just about people on the terraces and sort of football thugs and fights in streets, it was something that was much more deeply embedded in the fabric of Scottish society. People can sit in their chairs and their armchairs at home and say it's wrong what he did and he shouldn't be doing it, and they're right. But at the same time, you're not going to ever convince me that Donald Finlay's A, a bigot or a bad person. He could caught up in a situation where hundreds, hundreds of us have before, make no mistake about it, and he was, he was made a scapegoat for something that is, that is, that's rotted our game for a hundred years. Both clubs are now actively involved in combating sectarianism in the community. But how far is either willing to go to eradicate it from their own terraces when hatred has been so good for box office? If these supporters were chanting about someone's colour, the game would be stopped. The government would stop the game. But yet it's all right to do it if it's religion we're shouting about. It's tempting to think that if you could remove religion from the equation, the focus of the rivalry between Celtic and Rangers would shift back entirely to football. But I doubt it. My guess is that if you took away the Protestant and Catholic tribal badges, the bigots would quickly find other excuses to fight. Perhaps the challenge to both sets of fans is to live up to their religious labels or else do away with them altogether. I've never felt that it's this religion thing between Celtic and Rangers. I think that's the problem with the people that shout most about that. I don't have any religion or I don't believe in anything. Because Christianity is about loving God and loving your neighbour. And uh, the, the, the sad thing is that it's just part of this small part of the world that, that we are brought up in. And it's influenced by so many small-minded people that, that keep this whole thing ongoing. The idea of a cheerleader god supporting his chosen team from the terraces seems perverse enough. But sometimes God is meant to be on the team, a kind of super sub, ensuring that the game goes their way. Would a moral god take sides on the pitch? Would he win the game for his favourite side? Well, yes and yes, according to Alex Ribeiro, a former racing driver and chaplain to the Brazilian football team at the last four World Cups. I spoke to him as we watched highlights.